Shar Margolis, Shar Communications Incorporated, and Shar Vision LLC do not endorse or offer for any purpose but entertainment the views of any guest or other expert on Shar Vision or UBN. I knew things before they happened from the time I was a child. At the age of eight, I saw a spirit at the foot of my bed and didn't know what it was. And in my 20s, I finally realized I had a special ability that could help others. I have learned that love never dies. There is a spirit world that can communicate with us, and we all have the gift of intuition. Join me, and together we will explore the possibilities of the unknown from beyond and more. This is Shar Vision. Hi, everybody. I'm Shar Margolis, and this is Sunny Margolis, and welcome to Shar Vision. We have a great show for you tonight. Well, I, I think we should go right into the first guest. His name is William Stillman, and he's an internationally known award-winning author of The Autism and the God Connection. William, how are you? Hi, Shar. Oh, I can't hear William. Okay. Hi, hi, William. Hi, can you now? No, I need it a little. Okay. How about now? Yeah, that's better. Okay, we're okay. good. We're good. So Great. This, sure. is, this is, it's so nice to meet you, William. I'm honored. Thank you. Oh, that's so kind. So I, well, besides writing a book on autism, you wrote a book about, about canines and dogs and their, your companion pets. I don't, I don't know which one I want to talk about first, but you're really here to talk about autism. And there's so many people who have family members who, who are autistic. And um, tell us a little bit about what your book is, uh, is um, about. Well, it's actually a trilogy of books. And the first book came out almost 10 years ago, believe it or not. And it was really a way of proposing a speculation or a theory that I had arrived at through working in the field of serving people with different ways of being, unique ways of experiencing the world. And the theory was that these tend to be folks that are perceived as severely impaired or significantly incapacitated. Mm -hmm. And yet there's a delicious irony in that they were the very same folks who were probably most predisposed to be spiritually attuned because of their sensitivities. Whoa. Okay. So, but don't most autistic people have something that they do that's pretty genius as well? Well, not necessarily. Or, or like I, the Rain I, Man? I, is, that, is the Rain Man the same as an autistic person? The, the Rain Man has become a stereotype that... Um, unfortunately has defined autism in the minds of a lot of folks. Um, the analogy that I like to use is that of awakening in the middle of the night and uh -huh. realizing that your arm is dead from the elbow down. Right. And that's a fairly universal experience that a lot of folks have had. Yep. And in that moment, your brain, without even thinking of it, just automatically begins sending messages to that, that arm to move. And it will not budge of its own volition. Sometimes you have to, you know, physically move it mm -hmm. or try to roll your body and stretch it so that mm -hmm. you get the circulation flowing again and it becomes accessible to you once again. Well, what if that same nighttime paralysis arbitrarily shifted to any number of your limbs without warning throughout the day or lodged itself in your voice box and precluded you from articulating spoken language? Okay. This is this is exactly how my brothers and sisters with, with true classic autism describe their experience. They are buzzing and vibrating at such a high frequency. Their nervous system and emotions and the senses are magnified times 10. I call uh -huh. it spidey sense. And they're attempting to integrate with and make peace with a physical body that feels like cement. And Whoa. so this is why a lot of folks with autism, at least 50%, don't speak. 
And a lot of times we're talking about folks who are not as physically agile or as graceful as they would wish to be for trying to work with a body that feels like that dead arm. Do they know the difference? Mm -hmm. They see the difference. I mean, they see... But do they know when... Do they understand that they can't do this, that this is going on in them? Absolutely, because uh, they're, <laughs> they're being put through the paces with all kinds of therapy to try to, quote unquote, correct um, what it is that is perceived as anomalies. Okay, when so, you said brothers and sisters, they're not your blood family. You're just talking about your friend, the people you work with who are autistic. Well, I am also on the autism spectrum myself. You are? And so I think of those folks as, you know, my, my kin. Well, and how do how were you diagnosed? How what makes you oh and this is okay, so what makes you how do you know this? Well, I think there's uh, stereotypes about autism and there's the person who experiences classic autism, such as just what I described, but it's a spectrum. It's a spectrum of experiences and people with milder forms of autism or uh, what is called Asperger's syndrome, which right. is what I have, um, tend to pass for normal. Okay. And we, why, we tend to... why, why, what symptoms did you have to be, to know that you had Asperger's? I was um, definitely odd man out. As a kid, I was, um, people described me as moody and irritable, hypersensitive, cold, arrogant, and aloof, antisocial, and gifted. Those were words that people... And gifted. Yes, those were words that people used to describe me. But I was also socially ostracized, and I was verbally abused and Aww. physically harassed, Aww. and my speech and body language was publicly mocked and mimicked in front of bus drivers and cafeteria staff and teachers who did nothing. And so I descended into a really dark period of time. It lasted about seven to eight years where I was severely depressed, Aww. suicidal, and I developed post-traumatic stress disorder. So it really wasn't until I was in my mid-30s, so about 20 years ago, where I, as part of working Wait a in second. the field... You're, you're and, 50? Oh, I'm over that. <laughs> wow, you look good. Well, no. we don't age like everyone else. That's a little autistic humor there. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry but, for interrupting. Uh, Go on. I was working for a government agency, and we were beginning to explore providing services to families of young children being newly diagnosed with autism. And I began befriending adults with autism, mm -hmm. and I realized that I had a whole lot in common with them. And I knew I wasn't autistic, but um, I did have conversations with psychiatrists who said, this is your experience and use it. If it makes sense for you, identify as this. And I've gone on to write, uh, I have another book coming out in December. So it's mm -hmm. been about 11 or 12 books on the subject. Why are you called the autism whisperer? Um, that wasn't my phrase. That was something that someone dubbed me um, another interviewer. And I think it has something to do with my willingness and my desire to be of service to people by applying all that I know to be true about myself. I am not well read on the topic at all. I could probably count on one hand the number of books I've read about autism. So everything that I've written about has been drawing from what I know to be true about myself and my own personal you know, experiences. I, I actually I, respect that because I don't read other people's books on psychic things. I just write. Yeah. I don't read I don't read them because I don't want to copy what someone else wrote. Exactly. You don't want to be accused of imitating yeah. someone. And, you know, I, I feel that the work that I do is authentic in its own right. And it's been validated by people all over the world. My books have been translated in other languages, so th well, it resonates with people. But I apply the sensitivities that I have in the work to help people to realize that the single most important thing that they can remember when engaging with folks on the autism spectrum is to presume intellect, to presume the competence of the person who is unable to speak or 
as, is unable to assimilate as well as they would wish. Well, I have uh, uh, my nephew married a woman whose daughter is uh, has is, has Asperger's, and I will notice that she will just you know, uh, n not be tactful in social situ situations. But you seem to be able to control yourself very well in this interview. Well, uh, we are adept actors and very clever mimics, and it's uncomfortable for me to quote-unquote do people for right. extended, extended periods of time. Right. But I have learned to... I think sometimes I'm made up of bits and pieces of other people. I've learned to take things that I've seen other people do right. and put them back out in a reasonable facsimile and pass for socially acceptable under certain conditions. So do you uh, feel... I, I guess I'll take that as a compliment. Okay, well, you're, you, you, you're a sensitive and you're intuitive. Correct. And how... Do you feel like you're being guided in some way with this? Oh my gosh, absolutely. I, I've i got a ter terrific team. And by that I mean spirit, gu spirit guides. And That's I really go back, sure, some of those books wrote themselves and I'll go back and reread. And, re and you're read. psychic as well, right? Correct, yes. And so do you read for people? Yes. And do you read for the people who are autistic or have Asperger's as well? <laughs> I don't need to read for them. They read for me. <laughs> they read for other people. Um, here's the thing to understand also, particularly when we're talking about folks who live in silence because they're not wired for speech. Who else lives like that? If you think about it, the nun, the monk, the yogi, the guru, the priest. It's true. And... Those are folks that at some point in time made a conscious decision to deliberately enter into those extended periods that are states of solitude. Well, the person with autism was born into it naturally. They naturally know how to do it, so they are automatically and authentically connected to the source constantly. What? So, oh, go ahead. I'm so sorry. Go ahead, dear. Go ahead. So... What they have told me is, I've got my guides at my beck and call instantaneously. I have a direct line to God. My deceased grandfather is always accessible to me. Um, it is not unusual for people with autism to go off to be alone at the same time of day on a regular basis and engage in a two-way conversation that sometimes sounds like gibberish. Okay. Um, and this is this is something that Raymond Moody is exploring right now, uh, this whole concept of what people call nonsense talk, and is there really uh, a lexicon that corresponds with it? But so, I've had people tell me they're being mentored by angelic presences. Do you feel like there's something that is more unblocked in their brains than just maybe the average Joe? I think that people who are inherently gentle and exquisitely sensitive, mm -hmm. including people on the autism spectrum, mm -hmm. are probably more predisposed to tapping that aspect of their personhood than the average person. Why do you think there's been such a dramatic increase in autism diagnosis? That's the $64,000 question. Yeah. I've been working in the field for almost 30 years, and when I first began... In the field, it was estimated that uh, autism occurred in about one in every 10,000 individuals. It's now one in 68. And it one in is 68 not, people? Uh, one in 68 children. Children? Under what age? Children uh, from the age of what? How many years has this been going on? Uh, this would be data that's collected by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I need to stress that autism is not a disease, but that's the government agency that crunches the numbers. So uh, we're probably, we're talking about uh, people under the age of 21. Under the age of 21. So, so that what doesn't happened 21 the... years ago that started this increase to be one in 68 people, children? 
what do you think has caused this? In your intuition, in your, uh, we won't hold you to it. <laughs> Just what do you I've think? I've already written about it, so that's okay, Char. Um, I think it's a curious thing. You know, autism is four to five times more likely to occur in males than in females. It is not isolated to North America. This is happening worldwide, and the statistics in certain countries are narrower than they are in the United States. So when you think about who starts wars, who thrives on attaining power, who tends to be more competitive, who fuels the pornography industry, who tends to be more violent. What about... It's mostly, it's, it's mostly males. And so it's really interesting how over the next few decades to come, there could be a softening <clears throat> in the male gender. But what about like preservatives and food and uh, the, you know, added colors and, and all the things that we're eating that we shouldn't be eating? Oh, oh, for instance, huh, aspartame, that's poison. That's that's destructive from what I understand from Dr. David Brownstein, who's written many books. It's irreversible, the damage that it does to your brain. So in the last, how many years have people been eating that crap? Yeah, I think, you know, those of us who have very sensitive or delicate nervous systems are going to be susceptible to all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are lots of theories about what causes autism, but there is no one single known cause, which I also find very interesting. So it's a combination of different things. Uh, uh, you know, it, that's open for discussion. There is no one single known cause. And, <laughs> and do you find these people, the, your fellow friends that are autistic because obviously you're on um, a really high functioning scale of... well uh, spend 24 hours with me and you'll see it <laughs> <laughs> I right. am so sensitive to I, like to, you're sensitive going, to things going to Walmart on a Saturday afternoon when there's a sale on is my personal vision of hell <laughs> really Oh my gosh, I am so... Wait, are you picking up on other people's energies and feelings and... Do you, yeah. Is it difficult for you to like walk in the streets of New York? Yeah, um, I can't do airports very well at all. Yeah, um, I, I understand you know. that. I mean, I can deal with it, but I understand when I go to New York, I have to change my whole energy feeling and stuff. I feel like everybody's trying to get in my energy field. Yeah, and then you have to take a shower as soon as you get to your room and... Uh -huh. uh, you know, I, I, I'm like a sponge or a magnet all day long. And by the end of the, by eight o'clock at night, I'm exhausted and ready for bed. The thing is that I feel about you is that you're very pure. I feel like I appreciate you're a, that. I feel like you're a pure soul in a sincere, good soul who's just trying to help people. That and, is true. My station is I mean, to be... Uh, a, a teacher and an advocate. Yeah, I mean, I apologize. I haven't read your books. I, they have, weren't sent to me, so I'm just, you know, I, but I'm learning while talking to you, and I, I, I'm, I'm learning a lot. Now, how does multisensory perception affect people with autism? Well, just in the ways that we've been talking. So I think that what gets mislabeled or misinterpreted as severe behaviors is really just someone reacting to being completely overstimulated, if not overwhelmed, and not having a way to communicate it that would be acceptable. Well, I've known of some intuitive psychic people who get panic attacks around a lot of people or at parties or groups. Not me, but I mean, I... I, I like being around parties and groups. I, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to be able to do all that. But I can't imagine what it is to walk in somewhere and feel like you're being attacked energetically. Well, I spend a lot of time throughout each day in prayer and meditation. And as part of that process, I, you know, as you do when you work, I'm sure you, you create a shield 
around yourself that repels and deflects against anything that is not for your greatest good. Yeah, I do. And I always say a prayer of protection before every reading that I do. You bet. Every, every single reading. You bet. Yes, because you never know who you're going to encounter and what they're going to be bringing into the session with them. And so you, you find that autistic people, because the, there, there's really no filter, just kind of like out of the mouths of babes, say what they feel and feel what they say, and a lot of it's like perceptive and intuitive. It can be, yes. I, you know, I don't want to go to the other extreme by polarizing right. anybody as you know, God's special little angels. We're, no. we're, all <laughs> human, we're all human beings, and we all hold the potential to manifest our spiritual gifts and talents in a way that would be of service to others. Mm -hmm. And what is it that you do with animals? Um, <laughs> well... It's curious because, um, I, as I said, I do prayer and meditation throughout the day, and oftentimes that's on walks. And I live in a large development, and so I encounter a lot of people walking dogs. And it's been mostly dogs. But um, once I realized that it works the same way that it works with people, then I began to communicate with animals. And animals, obviously, they don't think in terms of uh, words or a language, they think in terms of impulses that we might associate with uh, feelings. And they also think in terms of pictures and images, which is how I think. I think in constant streams of visual imagery, pictures, mm -hmm. words, phrases, movies. And I remember the shock of realizing that the average person doesn't think that way. So for me to make the leap to being psychic um, was very uh, uh, natural and logical for me. And mm -hmm. then to make the leap to communicating with animals, and it's just a swapping of imagery. Um, so that's how that came to be. Hmm. Can, like, so can you read animals as well? Yes. Like yes. pe like people bring you animals to read and they have yes yeah <laughs> yeah it's really funny um, the interesting thing that people should understand about animals and for me again it's been mostly dogs is that they and I don't mean this in a in a way that would be disparaging or disrespectful but like the person with autism they also live in silence and so they are constantly connected to the source right. they don't. They don't think in terms of life and death. They think in terms of transitions in a continuous cycle. And so this is why the dog that is in pain or the dog that's dying and about to be put down will still look up at you with those big eyes and wag its tail. Right. They, they get it. They know what's going to happen. They're concerned with trying to comfort us. You know, I've had dogs that knew they were dying before anyone else did, and they're showing me a slowly setting sun, a gorgeous sunset Aww. that's setting in the sky. Aww. So that's a symbolic communication. Hmm. And you know, you know about that, because as psychics, that's, you know, that's how we work. We're interpreting things that we're being shown. Mm -hmm. and, and it makes sense about, because... We have to read our dog's minds to know what they're wanting. But we, we, we get some kind of communication going on that's just, you know, by, you know, by sensing each other. And so that's how you do that. And yeah, the so, curious thing is that um, most dogs, uh, depending, sometimes it comes with maturity. You know, dogs that are new are, you know, just all about the smells and the sights and everything. But most dogs fit, find their station. And they have very specific roles within the family. They take those they roles do. very seriously. Every dog has a job. Correct. They do. Correct. <laughs> I agree with you. And so do you find that dogs can, can communicate or people, autistic people or Asperger's people can communicate better with dogs than people or animals sometimes than people? 
Yes, and sometimes um, feral or wild animals. Uh, in the first book, Autism and the God Connection, there's a story about this little fella who was sitting uh, at the bus station waiting for his mom to pick him up from summer camp, and a fawn came out of the forest and approached him, and he got up and walked toward it. Now, you know, unless an animal, a wild animal, has rabies, that, does, that doesn't happen. That's extremely unusual. And when his mom came, the, the fawn it sort of interrupted the interaction that was going on, and um, the fawn turned around and went the other way and kept looking back at him. Aww. And um, hmm. she said, what, did, what was going on here? And he said, she was lost and uh, was looking for her mother, and she wanted me to comfort her. And wow, that's profound. And also, I feel that the wild animals sense when you're fearful. When you're not fearful, they're more apt to connect with you. Well, it, it, that's really interesting, Shar, because not long ago I was on one of my walks, and part of the path is going through the woods, and I saw a little red fox. And he ran away from me. And mentally I was saying, oh, no, no, don't run, don't run. And he says to me, he said, it's in my nature to run from anything larger than I am. Right. Um, and I told him, which made sense to me, and I told him, well, it's my nature to do that too. And <laughs> I could see him. He ran off into the woods. And then as I was continuing to have this dialogue, he sat down. Oh. Which I thought was a, a communication of relaxation. He felt your energy still, and you felt his energy. Which was really intriguing to me. Yeah. See, I'll tell you something. I feed the deer in Michigan. And they're wild, so I don't get close to them because I still want them to be afraid of most people because they should be. They should be, yeah. They should be. But when they know Nikki or I are coming with, with feed, they, and they, they teach their baby deer to eat. And it's so sweet because they trust us. Yes, and I believe that they can probably um, discern from the color of the aura around you whether it is safe to get near to you. Wow. That's a great compliment. You're fascinating. You're really fascinating. How can people get a hold of you, and how can people read your books and find you? Well, I, I know I'm transitioning out of the autism realm, so I'm no longer doing much work in that field at okay. this point. But people can go to my website, which is just my name, williamstillman.com. And if they click on the Facebook logo up in the upper left-hand corner of the homepage, uh, on my walks in my prayer and meditation time every day, I get about two to five quotes that come to me, original quotes of inspiration. How nice. And, and I, there's about 500 of them now. And every morning, oh. I send one to the person that manages the Facebook page for me. And she always manages to find the most amazing image to go with it. So I want to thank Sharon for doing that. But um, it might be a nice way for people to start their day. WilliamStillman.com? Yes, sure. Thank you. William, it's a pleasure to speak with you. My great privilege. Thank you for oh, having me. So and kind. hi to Sunny. You're so kind. Oh, yeah. Sunny, Sunny says bye. We're waking him up. He's got his. He's got. He's getting ready for Halloween. He's got his Halloween bow tie on. <laughs> Take good care of yourself. God bless. Thank God you. God bless you. Be well. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, you know what Sonny's doing? He's introducing our next guest. It's so good to see you. Come on and sit down. How are you? Hi. It's so good to see you. They need to. They need to put the the um, microphone on you. So this, my friends, is Dr. Meredith. It's, I never say it right. It's Chien. No, Chien. That's it. Yes. Chien is enough? That's enough. Yeah. Okay. This lady is amazing. This lady, when I have been sick in, when I've been in California, I come to this lady and she she does acupuncture, but she's not just and she has an MD. She she did acupuncture for um, 
Oh, in Israel for for where you were at the Sheba Medical Center in in Israel, and the late King Jordan, the King of Jordan, had at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, came to her just to see her. I mean, this lady is magic, and but healing and real and honest and. I, I can't even tell you how many times I've been when I've really had problems. And she says to me, look, stick out your tongue. You want to see my tongue? You have a very good tongue. I have a good tongue. <laughs> well, two weeks ago, I did not have a good tongue, did I? Yes. You can. Yes. Yeah, I came and I, I, my tongue wasn't good, but that's good. That means I'm healthy again. Yes. So, so tell us where, where you studied. You studied in China, right? China. Yeah, I, I was trained in China. In China, and, yeah, in the China Academy of the Chinese Medical Science in Beijing. In Beijing, yeah. Okay, and <coughs> excuse me. And now I know your husband does this as well, right? Yes. And is it true that your husband is next in line to be the head Chinese acupuncture doctor in China? Yes. He's next in line. Yes. Okay, we got like we got the top of the line here, kids. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, Tell, for people at home who really don't understand acupuncture, who really don't know what it is, tell us um, a little bit about what acupuncture is exactly. So acupuncture is ancient healing art. So then they will insert the needle to the acupuncture point. When we insert the needle correctly, so then we can balance the system. And also a scientific proof, if you you know, insert the correct, then they will enhance the neurotransmitter in the brain, which is endorphin. So that can balance our system, mm -hmm. like a neuroendocrine system. Mm -hmm. And also we can regulate immune system. And also we can balance the organs. So that's why it can heal the diseases. So how, there's so many places to be able to put those needles. How do you know where to put those needles? In China, the acupuncturist, you, at least you must go through five-year medical training. So that means you need to know the body. Mm -hmm. So you need to know, same as the Western medical training here. Mm -hmm. You need to know anatomy, you need to know biology, you need to do um, pathophysiology, and you also need to know diagnosis. Then, after that, you will learn the meridian system. So meridian system, classically, we have a regular, on the meridian, we have the 400 points. So addition to that, we have many, many other points. So it's a training, professional it, training. It is professional training. Yeah. But what about people who are afraid of needles? Yeah, if the people are afraid of needles, so then we have a consultation before we start the treatment. Mm -hmm. Then we explain to the patient, so this needle is much, much thinner from the diameter points than the Western injection. It's like nothing, you guys. Yeah, it's nothing. It's yeah. like, it's nothing. I mean, yeah. You don't even know it's in your skin. Yeah. So You, you don't even feel it. Yeah. Unless you're, you've got a sore underneath or there's, unless you're healing something and, yeah, and so that point has is sore. Yes, so usually I use the diameter of the needles is a 0.18 to 0.25 millimeter, so it's very thin. And also needle itself doesn't have any other material, just the needle itself, so we insert the point to regulate the patient's own energy towards to the health. So you get their chi going. Yes. You get their energy, their chi yeah. going. Yeah. What? What types of ailments do you work on mostly, or is it all different kinds? So from the WHO recognizes there's a healing arts, which is exists in China for over 5,000 years. So in the Western world, the first introduced was 1980, no, 1970, China. We have published acupuncture to do anesthetic. So put the patient under surgery, without doing anesthetic drugs. Without yeah. anesthetic, you yes. do acupuncture? Yes. No kidding. Yeah, so that's the first indication for acupuncture body to the Western world is to pain control. Pain control? Because, yeah, we can do acupuncture without anesthetic, can do surgery. So that means the first indication is to control the pain. Even when we cut the patient up, we can do acupuncture and without anesthetic, so it can go through the 
operation, it's like so open much, the brain uh, to the, you know. It's so much yeah. easier to have something done without anesthesia. That's what makes people sick. So have any, has anyone had a colonoscopy with just acupuncture? Not here. It happened in China. So here, not yet. Can I do that? In the future. Because I get sick from the anesthesia. <laughs> in the future, yes. In the future, so integrate Chinese medicine. When is it coming in? To When, is it, when are they going to accept it? Because it's five, how many years? Five thousand? Five thousand years. Five thousand years old. From China, yes. Come on, America, get with it. <laughs> no, China, it, America is much, you know, <coughs> open to the acupuncture. I have been here uh, since 98, started with the Mayo Clinic, and prior to that, I came to visit here in 96. So I think American public started to open heart right. to the acupuncture. I think maybe near future, we can do, you know, colonoscopy without any static, just use acupuncture. Okay, you heard you heard it here first, kids. That would be amazing. So, and and then, like when I when I've come to you, it's been for maybe sinus or flu or something like that. So, how how rapid is the healing effect of acupuncture in your eyes? I think it depends the patient's sensitivity and the knowledge about these healing arts, like you very sensitive and knowledgeable about these healing arts. So for you, when you come once or twice, you already feel much better. Right, like I do. Ago, you I only feel come much one better, time. But, but I accept it. Yes. I, I'm yes. so open. You're open. And also, I have to tell you, when, when the needles are in, I always fall asleep, even if I'm not tired. Because we, I fall asleep yeah. and I feel like I'm elevated. Yeah, that's what, that's what I said. The acupuncture enhances the, the neurotransmitter endorphin. So you are very, you know, relaxed. So you are kind of elevated and, you know, lightening. So with mm -hmm. you, especially your spiritual person, so easy to have the best result. Because I'm open and I accept it and I'm positive. Yes. So, oh, so you got to be positive and accepting when you do this, guys. And and so, if people want to get a, I'm sure people will want to get a hold of you. How do they do that? Do they? Do you have a website? Not yet. I have a website. You have a website. Yeah, I have. Oh yeah. my God! You're 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 right on top of everything. Yeah. What is that? So website is a Beverly Hills Acupuncture Herbology. Okay, Beverly Hills Acupuncture Herbology Herbs dot com. Is it Herbs dot com or Herbology? Herbs dot com. Herbs dot com. Okay. Beverly Hills Acupuncture Herbs dot com. Yeah. Okay, that's really good because I I mean I've I'm impressed with what I've seen you do and you teach every day, don't you? Or I almost teach, every day. Almost every day I teach, yeah. Where I, do you teach? I teach three schools here and I train here the master degree acupuncturist and the doctor degree master acupuncturist. Whoa. Yeah. And, and, and how do you, how can people tell the difference between a good acupuncture person and a bad one, acupuncturist? I think you should because the acupuncture in the California, they have their board, they, you can verify their license. And also if they have, they have website, you also check out their background. You can check their background. Yes. Are there fake acupuncture people? I think no. <laughs> Not that you know of. Not that I, I know of. Not yeah. that you know of. Yeah. And then you also work with herbs. Yes. So what are the herbs from China? Yes, herbs from China, but they import it from China. So they do through the um, certain kind of the regulations. So it's a safe. So do you ever like help people lose weight? Sometimes I do, yeah. Sometimes you can help people yes. with losing weight. Yes. And, and what about if, like in China, if somebody has cancer, yeah. is it possible to get help with acupuncture? So for the cancers, for my knowledge, we should send a patient has, uh, you know, supervision of the oncology. So if the oncology said that they could combine with the integrated medicine, then you could. Yeah, but at first they should under regular treatment. Are there herbs that they give people for cancer? They do, yeah. 
I would do very often for this group patient. Is it is it certain herbs? I mean, certain cancers, or just like certain herbs help certain cancers? Yes, we have. Yeah, because the cancer we consider as you know a mutation of the cells. So that's kind of a condition we use herb to reduce that mutation of the cells. So it's a mutation of the cells. Yes. What about someone who has AIDS? The AIDS, because it's a part of the AIDS, the reason is their immune system compromised. So for the acupuncture can regulate and enhance the immune system, so that can suppress the AIDS virus. So it's most important to boost up the immune, immune system, system. Yeah. and the adrenals yeah. and stay healthy so we're not fighting so many different things and our you know, problems that could come up. That's right. Now, do you ever suggest about, what if somebody's on an airplane a lot or goes places that, where there's germs? Is there anything you suggest for preventative of getting sick? Yes, yeah, that's the Chinese. A very important part of our practice is to emphasize the prevention. So in China, we have saying, if you're a good doctor, you do not treat a sick patient. You just keep the patient healthy to prevent the illness to happen. Well, you're a good doctor because I, I didn't see you for two years. <laughs> I tried my best. <laughs> so, yeah, for the, if they're often traveling, I would suggest the patient before to go to the airport, come get one session acupuncture treatment and also get some herbs to boost the immune system and also to prevent the virus attack. Oh, that's very, very Interesting. So it's all about preventative. Yes. One very important I part. like that saying. Who made up that saying? No, is it real? It's not the who made up. It's no. China. Preventive treatment is the most important It's part. the most important. Yeah. Like you do. You do come for prevent treatment. I do come for preventive yeah. treatment. Yeah. I yeah. do. I do, and I think it's really important. Yeah. Wow. So, okay, let's give people your... Are you ever going to write a book? Oh, I have many books. You have many books? Yes. She's so humble. I had no idea. <laughs> yes. What, what, can people get your books? Is this what they study in the schools? Or yeah. can, is it like for me to read? Mostly it's the schools. In the schools. So you're, so you write the textbooks yeah, for text the doctors who are learning yeah. Chinese, wow, acupuncture. That's yes. amazing. Yeah. Okay, so give, okay, so you're, your website again is Beverly Hills Acupuncture Herbs. Herbs. Dot com. Dot com. Well, thank you so much for being here. You are wonderful. Thank you I, to I'm honored. Me. I'm I am, honored to be here. I'm honored that you're here. Thank Truly you. honored. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks. Okay, everybody. Well, this has been um, really fun. And now we've got a reading. a reading for you to see. So hang in there. We ask the universal consciousness that holds the highest spiritual power of knowledge, wisdom, and truth to guide and protect us. As we communicate with our guides and angels in the spirit world and tap into the wisdom of the universe, we respect this opportunity and take full responsibility to use this not for ego or controlling others, but with the pure intention of spreading love and healing life on this earth and beyond. I feel it's your time now. I don't know. Have you ever had your chart done, your astrological chart? Not for a long, long time. I, I feel like you should have your chart done. Okay. And I also feel like this is a new beginning for you, and it's time to step it up. Okay. Yeah, I feel like you need you need to really get very proactive because mm -hmm. I feel like this is your time. Okay. And I feel like this is where you need to really get proactive and do what you need to do to get to where you want to go. And I also feel that you you yourself need to do more networking, okay. connect with more people, okay. be more social. Get in like be out there. Okay. Is your dad deceased? Yes. I didn't talk about him yet, right? No. 
Is there, there's not an L in his name. Yes. Does it start with L? Yes. Is he L-E or L-O? L-O. Like Louis? Yeah. Louis. His, Louis. No, Louis. Yeah. He's, he just came in here. Oh. He's been here protecting us, watching over us, you, watching over you, but he just came in. He, he adores you. Do you know that? He uh, loves you. He never showed it. No. He, <laughs> I feel like he's proud of you. He knows differently now because he's grown on the other side. Right. You're, you're an older spirit than him. Like even a two-year-old can be an older spirit than a 90-year-old. <laughs> like karmically right. and in lifetimes. And he's... He loves you. He he's sorry he never was there for you. Okay. He's apologizing to you. Okay. Lewis is apologizing to you. Okay. I feel like he should apologize to your mother as well. Oh yeah. Because he's saying he was rotten. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. He left people. Yeah. And didn't give money. No. He was a <laughs> He was me. <mean>. Snore. <laughs> yeah. He was me. <laughs> you know, the thing is we choose our parents. Believe it or not. <laughs> <I'd rather> not. <laughs> Go figure. But life is a school, and we're right. here to learn lessons. And that's why we're all here. So right. you chose him for whatever reason to learn your lessons. Right. You're so elegant. You're so classy. You're so, like, you would have done very well in another country like in Canada or other <laughs> countries. Have you ever worked in Canada? No. Yeah. I don't know if you're if you would be able to, but you need to find people who are more international. No, no, just more sensitive to life like you right. are. Right. You're down to earth. You're not a pushy person. Right. So you need somebody to help get you in those things. Where's your mom? Oh, I was just thinking. Is your about mom it. deceased? Yeah, she I is. feel like your mom's coming in at the very end of this, so I need to find her. I feel like she's been waiting. I feel like she's being very polite because mm -hmm. she wants you to have the information you need. You have a big energy, and you have a good energy. But if you have doubt about yourself or you get insecure, it's a block for you. Okay. You block yourself sometimes, I right. think. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm light years better than I used to be about that. You've got to stop blocking. Yeah. You, you're great if you do it for someone else. Yeah. You're just not great if you do, do it, it for, for you. myself, yeah. And I really feel your life's lesson now is to do it for you. Yeah. It's time to move on. Okay. But you have to be have the guts to do it. Okay. And you've got to stop energetically putting blocks up. Okay. You put blocks up. Okay. You do, right? I or you used I have to. I used to. You I don't anymore. To. I don't anymore. So you're going for it now. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so Thank much. You. You're Thank so you. You're so lovely. Much. Oh my God, you're so lovely. <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs> so my pleasure, really. Thank you. It's a delight to, to read for you. You've got the nicest energy. Thank you very much. The sweetest, the dearest energy. Thank you for good news. <laughs> yeah, well, make it happen. Don't make <laughs> okay. a liar out of me. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I'm glad that there was positive information. Um, shocking. I, re My father and I had a horrible relationship, so very shocked that he came through in the reading. And um, just very, very, I have a ton of gratitude to get some information that I can actually use to move forward and, and have some clarity, you know, at a very confusing time. I met Shar a long time ago and was always in awe of her gift and how she handled it so gracefully. So it was really cool to see her so many years later and get to actually get a reading. So that was very, very nice. I want to thank all my guests today and Elisa, my producer who makes everything happen, and John and Tony and Gina and everyone, and of course Sunny, and most of all, all of you for joining me. And I look forward to talking to you and seeing you next week. Thanks so much. I want to.
If you like what you've seen on Shar Vision, then go to Shar.net and book a personal reading with me, or join a group reading, or join one of my workshops where I teach you to be psychic and intuitive.